your Bible's open to Hebrews 13, let's finish up this book today. What do you say? You up for that? We've been in this book 29 weeks, by the way. We have one more week to go, and that's next week. It's week 30. But next week is going to be a week in which we bring the elders up front. We're going to do some live Q&A. We've got some questions that are still remaining from previous weeks, so we're going to kind of ask the elders. They're going to join me in this boat that I row every week of answering questions without knowing what they are. Uh, we'll do that with you. I'll, we'll share each of uh, the elders. will share things that God has been teaching us. And so it's a good way to kind of bring series to conclusions. We've done it before. It works out really well. So that's next week. So that's going to be more of a summary review of the whole book. Today we're actually going to finish the text of the book, Hebrews 13. We're going to go through the end of the book and, and see how this thing closes, all right? Again, this is week 29 in our series, Jesus Loud and Clear, Front and Center. And I think the question that's answered in the last few verses is this question. What should church leaders pray for their church? And you say, why is that a question that he answers? Well, I personally think it flows out of the fact that he asked the church people to pray for them. That's around what, verse 18, verse 19 in Hebrews 13? He says, pray for us. It's one of those ways that they could show their, their biblical loyalty to elders. To their leaders. Remember, loyalty and love were the, were the two kind of umbrella ways that, that we live out a life of worship. Well, on the heels of that, he says, by the way, here's how we're praying for you. And in verses 20 and 21, he kind of lays out the prayer that he has for the church. So, bef- so I want to answer that question today. I want to say, how do church leaders pray for the church? But before I get there, I do want to answer a question that's been coming in periodically about the authorship of Hebrews. I get this every few weeks. Well, Todd, when are you going to tell us who you think wrote Hebrews? So I'll answer that today because I think the evidence that I have, and I wouldn't even use the word evidence, the clues that I have are in the final verses here. I'll just go ahead and spit it out to you. I've changed my mind from 30 years ago. Just this week, I just kept digging and digging. My wife asked me an honest question at Lighthouse last week that kind of stumped me. Um, she does that a lot, but this was in the whole lighthouse. So I'm just sitting there like, I don't know the answer to that question. It caused me to kind of dig really deep, and I've changed my mind on who I think wrote Hebrews. Uh, in fact, I've kind of gone back toward the orthodox, traditional view that was held before the 1800s. It wasn't until 1800 that other authors came on the landscape, to be honest with you. I now think Paul was probably, in my opinion, the originator, the writer of the book. Now, that is... You can't amen a, an opinion, Paul, okay? I just am honest with you. But that made me laugh. I appreciate it. I was about to say that's, that's pure conjecture. Please don't board that train. And then Paul says amen. I, don't, I love you, man. That's awesome. Um, you know, I'm probably wrong in that. That's how loosely I hold this. That's where I'm at right now. I could change next week. I'll speak to Chris and Carlos later. I mean, Tony's already taken me to task for this view already. One of our elders, like Paul. I have some reasons why, though, and I can share those with you. I won't do that here because of time, but, yeah, I, I tend to think it has a lot of Pauline character traits. I can't get around Hebrews 2, 3, which says that this was a second-generation type of audience, so I'm kind of stumped on that one, I'll be honest with you. I don't know how to get around that. But the other pieces of evidence or clues weigh pretty heavily for me that I think are in this. One is the writer does seem to be incapacitated, imprisoned, or something's happening in verse 19. And I think it's from Rome that Paul was in prison. I do think that Paul either gave this message to those who were listening to him in prison or in house arrest. They probably transcribed it or copied it. So that's why I say he's the originator. He's the one who spoke it. I don't know if he wrote it, but I do think he was the preacher of it. He may have written it. We don't know. Um, but here's, what I, here's an opinion I hold about the last few verses, and this is why I think Paul did it. I think Paul probably preached this in prison or under house arrest, and some of his companions, probably Luke or Timothy, were either copying it or transcribing it. Something happened where Timothy, I think, had to depart, was released, and I think personally, this is an opinion, Verses 22 through 25 were written by Paul's own hand. I think the book was, was Paul's sermon, 
But I think he added 22 through 25 as a PS by his own hand, which is why it says, look what it says. I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation. The words there just mean my word that comes alongside. Now, you could say that means he's encouraging them to obey. It's his preaching word. You could. Or you could see it as it's, an, it's a PS that's coming alongside the letter he just, the sermon he just preached. So Paul's writing this, he calls it next, a brief word. Now, it only takes about an hour to read through Hebrews. If you preach this, it'd be longer than what I normally preach, about an hour. But that's still considered short to most preachers. Or you might just see the fact that maybe Paul is saying he's adding a PS to the actual end of the book, which ends with the word amen in 21. Paul has actually realized he doesn't have the person to, to kind of transcribe the sermon. So he is writing a final PS to get on the end of this book before it's delivered. Now, that's not entirely impossible, but it's not highly likely either because we know Paul suffered from a number of physical calamities. So could he have written a few sentences? Maybe, maybe not. That's my opinion that he added this as a PS onto a sermon that I think he preached while under house arrest or in prison. And I think Timothy is one of the ones who was with him because his name is mentioned. Or it could be Luke because in 2 Timothy, Paul actually says in his final imprisonment, only Luke is with me. So if you had to press me, I would say that it comes down to Paul, Timothy, and Luke. I think Paul preached it, Timothy or Luke copied it, and that's how we have it. It's my opinion. I'm probably wrong. Form your own based on the clues you find, okay? By the way, one last clue to give you on this, because I can tell you're all just drooling at the mouth for more of this kind of uh, non-important information, right? <laughs> I've, I found an interesting connection in Scripture that probably pushed me over the edge back to Paul as an orthodox view on who wrote Hebrews. Peter said in 2 Peter 3, towards the end, verses 18, 17 in there, he talks about Paul's letter to Jewish people who were dispersed because of persecution. And he says, Paul wrote to you. And then he says, when he writes, there are things hard to understand. That's the phrase he uses. Peter says this about Paul's writings to Hebrews who were dispersed and persecuted. What does Hebrews do? It actually unpacks, if you look at chapter 7 and chapter 6, things that are hard to understand. Melchizedek. And that phrase, that type of wording is used by the author to say, hey, I would love to explain more, but you're hard of hearing. I can't. These are difficult things to grasp. Remember that passage of Scripture? I think that's Peter referring to what Paul wrote in this book. Now, that's an opinion. I'm probably wrong. That's just where I'm at today, okay? But all of that considered along with some other things, I've changed my mind on that. And I tend to think Paul probably was the one who preached this, added a tag at the end, and for reasons we don't know, it's left it anonymous. By the way, he ends this book the same way he ends all of his other books. He doesn't begin it the same way, so that's an issue too. But all in all, that's where I land. Hope you have your opinion. In the end, it really won't matter. Regardless of who wrote it, here's the prayer these leaders prayed for the church. All right? Here's the prayer they prayed. It's verses 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace... Oh, by the way, that phrase, God of peace, is used six times in the New Testament. Guess who used that phrase? <laughs> Say it with me. Paul. It's, it's a Pauline phrase used six times. Just thought I'd throw that in there. Um, now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Say it with me. Amen. Where I think the book actually, or the sermon actually ended. Now here's the prayer that those church leaders are praying for the church. And by application we can say that they're, this is a prayer we should pray for our church and we should pray for you and you should pray for each other. 
Now, I want to address this prayer from three angles today. I want to ask ourselves, what is he actually requesting? How does he say it's possible? And why does he say it's necessary? Can we do that? Let's answer three questions. What, how, and why? Here's the gist of his prayer. I'll kind of show it on the screen behind me, but I'm going to work from my Bible. You mark in yours. Let's kind of understand what he's calling us to. He says, now may the God of peace, and you got to skip down to verse 21 now. This is the primary verb here in the, in the request. Now may the God of peace equip you with every good thing that you may do his will. There's the gist of the request. So the church leaders are praying for this faith community that God would equip them with everything good to do his will. That's a good prayer request, isn't it? And it's, it's more than a request, so that's not really the best word. It's really more of a prayer fact. Here's what God will do. Pray in line with that. It's kind of the way it's, it's written. Now, the, the operative word here, at least from a verb point of view, is the word equip. What does that mean? There's two primary ways to understand equip, and they mean the same thing in the end. But one would mean to bring to a situation the resources necessary, uh, the supplies to accomplish the task. Another aspect would be to say that you're, you're repairing something that's broken to make sure that it's fully operational again. For instance, this word is used when it says the disciples would come back from fishing. It says they would mend their nets. Same word here. When he equips, he mends. Could it be that maybe some of the believers in this faith community were broken in some sense? Remember, he uses the word uh, lame in Hebrews, I think it's 12. Talking about, notice what's lame so it doesn't get out of joint. So there's some, maybe some similarities there. Um, this is the same word used in Galatians 6.1, that if we see someone in sin, we should restore that brother, considering ourselves, lest we're also tempted. Same word there, to, to, to set a bone that's broken is kind of the idea of the word. Or to bring to something the supplies and resources needed to make sure it's fully operational. Either way, what it's saying is that God... Uh, here's the prayer. God, give us everything we need to do your will. That will happen, and that's how we should pray. Now, notice that this prayer hinges upon something. That we're praying that God would give everything good that we may do His will. You see, that's a really important three-letter word there, His. Here's how we pray in the American church. God, give us everything good for our will. Or we pray this. God, give us everything good, period. And can I warn you as an honest pastor and teacher to you who wants to teach you the Bible without preconceived notions or unnecessary filters, this verse says that God will give everything you need, it will be good for you, and it will be for the purpose of accomplishing His will. That's the prayer to pray. How should your elders and deacons and staff pray for you? That God will give you everything good to get his will done and what that does then is this makes things that we think are bad really become oh god could use that in a good way if it gets his will done yes i don't say that glibly i don't say that to you lightly i look across the room there are many of you with deeper pain than our family's ever known some of you currently are in severe trials and stress. I realize that. I think about just the, just the pain we've known in our time. You're saying, Todd, that, that God would use that. And I should consider that as good from his hand if in the end it accomplishes his will. Yes. He will give you everything good to make sure his will gets done by the way i think there's a perspective issue here too i don't think that we see everything as good if we aren't if we aren't seeing his will as the primary objective if just getting our way is the aim 
if just accomplishing what we think is important is the goal, then the possibility is strong that when things don't go like we think, we're going to be upset. We're going to point and blame God. Does that make sense? But when His will is primary, then we accept from God what He knows is necessary to accomplish His will. This is the prayer that we are to pray. This is the reality that that we're to embrace and kind of be in line with. That that God wants to give us everything necessary and it's good to accomplish His will. Now, I want to ask you to do something something for me today. Because normally, after I explain the text, I take your questions. Not today. I answered one at the beginning. I want to ask you a question. Have you helped me today? Because when I read this phrase, my question is this. Well, what will... What are things that that I can do that would be God's will? His word lays it out for us. What are the things in his word? What what is the will of God that I should do? That's what it says. He's going to give me everything good so I can do his will. I'm an action-oriented person here, right? I want to do something. I want to do God's will. That's what's going on here. That's the prayer. So I want you to text in. We'll make a list while I'm preaching this text. What are ways, according to the Bible, that we do God's will. Now, can, you ask, can I ask you, don't leave me high and dry here, okay? Get your phone out, put it on silent or vibrate, but text in to our number, not questions today, but text in ways that we do God's will. Notice what I didn't say. I didn't say ways we vote on God's will, analyze God's will, uh, form a committee for God's will, discuss God's will, ways that we what? Do God's will. I love this verse because he kind of cuts through all the church politics. And he says, you know what? You need to be a person kind of leaning towards action. Amen. It's my kind of language. That's why I'm really not afraid to fail. I'm not really afraid to try many things. That rubs some people the wrong way. Because I'll give anything a shot. If it doesn't work, we'll say, hey, we know that didn't work. Let's try something else. And sometimes folks are like, well, we looked bad in that. And, but you know what? Man, let's just do something, right? This author here is saying, hey, God's will is an action-oriented item. So, while I'll explain the rest of this text, will you text in ways in which we do God's will? As we get to the end, we'll kind of review them as a way to make some application for this right here. So here's the gist of the prayer. Here's what he's praying. That the God of peace would equip the church, that faith family, with everything good so they could do His will. How is that possible? Well, the beginning phrase tells us. And then one of the final phrases tells us. Look how this word equip is bookended. It's the God of peace working in us. Do you see that in your Bibles? The God of peace equips you working in us. So so here's how God equips you to do His will. He apparently works in you. So he's asking for some actions on the outside. But where does he actually begin and do his work? Say it with me. On the inside. We'll move to the next slide if we can and, and show this kind of outlined on the, on the verses. Now, when you see that God's going to do something in you, he's working in here, in order that you may do something on the outside, his will, sometimes we ask ourselves this question, well, can God get that done? Now, you may not want to admit you ask that. But we look at our situation, we look at our personalities, our talents, our skills, or the lack of them. We say, man, can God really use this? Can he use me? Well, I love what he does. He, he talks about the God of peace and describes him. And look how powerful and mighty the God of peace is who's working in you. Look what he says. These descriptors of the God of peace. And by the way, the descriptors all point back to the main title given to God here, the God of peace. Look what he says. He says this God of peace is, first of all, one who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus. So the God of peace raised Jesus from the dead. Now, just think, if if he raised his son from the dead, do you think he can equip you to do his will? The answer is should be an astounding, obvious yes. Well, man, I don't know if God gave me strength to witness to my neighbors. Hey, 
He raised his son from the dead. Your neighbor is no big deal to God, you know? I'm not sure God can handle this bill. And I'm running low in the checking account. My finances. He raised his son from the dead. He's got your bill covered. I mean, do you see what's happening here? He's kind of letting us know, by the way, the God who's going to equip you, he's done the most magnanimous thing already. Raised his son from the dead. Who is this son? He describes him further by saying he's the great shepherd of the sheep. And this shepherd of the sheep here, it was his blood that was shed, satisfying God's wrath forever, thus establishing an eternal covenant. Do you see that? Not an annual covenant, not one to be repeated as in the Mosaic Law, but here, watch this, an eternal covenant. So the great shepherd came to seek and save that which was lost. Now watch this. It all points to the God of peace. The great shepherd came to seek and save that which was lost, to, to uh, bring into the fold all of God's sheep. He did that by giving his life for the sheep, at which point God the Father saw that, accepted that sacrifice as eternally sufficient for the debt of our sin, raised Christ from the dead, vindicating and showing that he's accepted the sacrifice. And so now all those who were going astray, right? All of us like sheep, we were gone astray. We turned everyone to his own way. All of that was happening, but the shepherd of our soul shows up, redeemed us by his blood. God sees it, is satisfied with it, raises Christ from the dead. And guess what? You are now at peace with God because of the shepherd of your souls. That's why the author here says it's the God of peace. Because he raised from the dead Jesus who gave his blood to fully satisfy God's wrath. The covenant is in place. He's faithful to it. You're not at war with God anymore. Those who believe and have trusted Christ, who've turned from sin, repented, and have put their faith in Jesus, guess what? You're not at war with God. Romans chapter 5 Romans chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So this is the God of peace who is working in us in order that we would work and do his will. Should we really ever wonder if God can get this done? (laughs) Not at all. The same God who has the power to who had the power and showed the power to raise his son from the dead, is the same God who by his Holy Spirit lives in you as his child. And he will give you everything you need. He'll work in you perfectly so that you can get his will done. And that's confidence, church, isn't it? That's the prayer we're praying. So what is the prayer? That God would equip us with everything good for his will. How does that happen? The God of peace. By the way, here's the descriptors. He's mighty, compassionate, and faithful. That God, he will work in you to make sure then that you can work out for him. That's what's going on here. Why is this important? Necessary. Why does it matter? That's the last few phrases. It says he's working in us that which is pleasing in his sight and that this is the one to whom belongs the glory forever and ever. Amen. So, so when God works in us, it's, it's something he's doing in us that is pleasing and glorifying and that's what enables us then to, to do his will. What is it that he's working in us? That's a very good question. The text does not tell us. You know that? This verse does not tell us what it is he's working in us. Look at it again. That God, who's the God of peace, he wants to equip us with everything good, working in us that which is pleasing. What does the word that refer to? You ever asked that question? What's God doing in us that enables us to do his will on the outside? Well, we don't know based on this verse. I'm going to tell you what I think it is. All right? I have a stronger opinion on this than I do who wrote the book, by the way. I think if you take the, the whole of Hebrews, the motif of the book, the background, the recipients, the five warning passages, the, the overall thread and stream of this 13 chapter epistle, I think the word that refers to an enduring, persevering 
faith. I think that's what God is working in us. The kind of faith that in the trials and tribulations that would make us want to quit and let go, He's working in us a type of faith that holds on, stays firm, doesn't fall away or fail to obtain or fall short. I think Hebrews 11 bears this out. The word faith is a very common word in that chapter. It it shows people who by faith persevered and endured. I think the five warning passages lean this way. And so I think if you had to say, what is it that God's working in us? It is a long-term, enduring, persevering faith. And at the end, when we are finally home in the new city we're looking for, right? That one we're longing for, that God is building. When we're there... That type of life, that type of endurance brings glory to God. It's pleasing to Him, and it brings glory to Him. It shows that He finished what He started. He didn't lose a single one. His power and glory is not like, oh man, I I, I didn't do very well with Eric. Rats. That's not going to happen. Those who are His, He'll bring fully all the way home. That's what he's working in us, an enduring, persevering faith. You know why I like that and why I think that's what's going on here? It's because that's a work only God can do. You can't make yourself more saved. You can't strive harder and get more of heaven. The only way you'll ever endure to the end is to know that God has got you. And that no man can pluck you out of his hand. And that he has got a firm grip on you. Like an anchor, he's got your soul. And he's reeling you all the way home. What did Jude say? He said that, It is God who keeps us from falling. I heard John Piper say one time, I'll never forget this. He said, if I could lose my salvation, I already would have. (laughs) He's right. So what is it that he's working in us? An enduring, persevering faith that... He never lets go of us, and so we never let go of Him. And that type of life in the end is the kind that does His will. Does that make sense? And why is that necessary? Because that's what's pleasing and glorifying to God. I think, by the way, this is the only sane way to see the word pleasing. If you see the word pleasing here as describing things that you do on the outside, which by the text, you can't really make that connection. But if you were to... You run the risk of figuring out, well, what's pleasing to God, what's not. and you know, It's kind of a, a relative, perhaps, definition. But when it's what's inside of you, and it's the enduring, persevering faith that God is building, is that pleasing to God? Yes. That He would finish what He starts. Does that bring glory to Himself? Yes. And so I think what He's talking about here is an incredible spiritual Uh, God wrought work in our hearts that causes us to never give up all the while doing his will God sees that is pleased and ultimately glorified this is the prayer those leaders prayed for that church it's a pretty good prayer isn't it I mean kind of cuts to the core of what's going on Focuses us, gives us perspective. This prayer, of course, is on the heels of verses 1 through 19. So so let me just try to give you this prayer along with the other verses kind of in a nutshell. Can I do that? Because we've been giving you a passage summary for two weeks. Talking about 1 through 19, how we should live with attitudes and actions that that are worshipful. We just kind of talked about them. Loving God's children, being loyal to God's leaders. We've kind of broken those out. And we've described that as a, as a lifestyle of worship that's more than music and goes beyond the service. 
But we can't leave off these two verses because these two verses show how that's all possible. That's why this prayer of those leaders is so important. These leaders, where they just, where they just simply ask their church and this faith family to do these things, man, that just drives people crazy. Adding to the do list and the human power, fleshly things, it worries you out. You know, you just, you never do them good enough. You're left feeling guilty. And it's like, man, who needs that? But when you have these verses, then you realize it's God working in us, accomplishing his will. Then 1 through 19 are an overflow of what God's doing in us. So here's the passage summary from two weeks ago and last week. Here's how it's worded. Read it with me, would you? Till God's kingdom is consummated, Christians are to demonstrate acceptable worship in their actions and attitudes. That's the, the gist of the first 19 verses. Love God's children, be loyal to God's leaders. And you can list those and break them out. All coming from Hebrews 12, 28. This is how we live a life of acceptable worship. But here's 20 and 21 and even through 25. Here's what really makes this possible. Let's read it together again. Ready? Till God's kingdom is consummated, Christians are to demonstrate acceptable worship in their actions and attitudes, understanding that it is God who is at work in and through them. So 1 through 19, they don't happen unless the God of peace is equipping you by working in you that which is pleasing and glorifying to him. Can we just all admit, that's a load off my shoulders and yours too. Amen. I mean, did you really want to come this morning and go home with a checklist? <laughs> I didn't, okay? I'll just go ahead and get that out there. But do you come to have your soul nourished? I do. And isn't that what the Word of God does for us? Nourishes our souls. Here's some soul nourishment for fellow travelers. God will get his will done through you. Don't worry. <laughs> He's working in you to finish what he started. And everything he brings your way that he knows you need to get his will done, in the end, that's a good thing. Because he's working in you an enduring, persevering, long-lasting faith that will bring glory to him and be pleasing in his sight. And that's a great prayer to pray for each other. Now, how does that then translate, Todd? Uh, if you were to shorten it, that's, that's a lot of words. Not, not as many as the first 25 verses, but that's a lot of words. Could you make that shorter for us? Translate that in six words. I'll be glad to. Thank you for asking. God works in, I work out. Say it with me. God works in. Now by memory. Let's try it. Ready? God works in, I work out. Guys, here's Hebrews 13 in six words. God works in, and I work out. And you switch this around, then, then you really flip what the gospel is all about. You change this order, and you're in, you've entered into a white-knuckled arena of religion. But you keep it like this. Where there is a lifestyle of worship that's seen in our attitudes and actions that's empowered by a God who raised his son to prove he was fully satisfied with the sacrifice. That same God is working in us to make sure his will gets done. Man, that's a God then that we can fully submit to, surrender to, worship. And as we live our life both in here and out of here, it's an, it's an expression of worship. We're just simply showing on the outside what God is doing on the inside. That's Hebrews 13, guys. And that's how he concludes this book. He's asking people to realize it's God that's working in you through Jesus to get his will done. So what do you say now we take a minute and see how you answer my question? If that's what God is doing, if he's working in me mightily to make sure his will gets done... What are ways that we do His will? Ah, let's see how you did today, can we? We have five screens. Okay, in the first service they had four. You win. Way to go. Um, no, first service, man, they just did a great job, sent a bunch of good answers in. Um, and I appealed to you as well. You did a great job. Thanks for rescuing your pastor and not leaving me high and dry up here to be embarrassed in front of you. 
Uh, if you just did that, I appreciate it. I owe you one. Thank you very much. But here's some things you said are ways we can do God's will. That we can have a bent towards action. Let's read through them. Spread His Word. To love all unconditionally. To glorify God in thoughts and action. To enjoy Him and help others to do the same. To testify. To act with honesty and integrity on the job. To walk humbly, act justly, and love mercy. To love people, discipline our children, follow His Word. Making amazing omelets <laughs> with your children while you're reading the Bible. I'm sure that's what that means there, right? <laughs> to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. To serve the church, the community, to testify, to care for widows and orphans. To be joyful in our circumstances. To obey the Great Commission. By the way, we had a word invented in the first service. Uh, the word go bay. I didn't think of it. But it was actually a typo uh, in the end, and it was a great typo. I mean, isn't that awesome? We should go bay. I, I'm good with that. I think it's a great word. So I thought of that, the Great Commission, like, we're just going to start using that. Go bay. I mean, I'm, I'm totally stoked on that word right now. I love that word. <laughs> Live holy, working with him on our sanctification, to fast, to pray, to trust in his word, regardless of the cultural rub, to sacrifice my will for God's will. To show love to the unlovely, to glorify God in thoughts and action, to help those in need, to not conform to the world, to teach our children truth and training them in the way they should go. Lastly, praying for my non-Christian co-workers, striving to be a faithful Christian example. Is God's will you should be holy, avoid sexual immorality, to give thanks in everything, including the hard times. It's a pretty long list. Hey, congratulations. Those are things that we do to, to uh, accomplish God's will. Now, you may at this very moment think, wow, you said, Todd, I would not leave with a checklist, but that's a pretty big checklist. And you, I mean, I'm, I'm holding you to it, Todd. You, you kind of said that you're going to nourish the soul, the spirit, but reading through that, man, this crowd's got a bunch of things they want me to do. Let me end with the three, what I would think are the uh, three great closing words in Hebrews 13, which I think actually brings the sermon to a close. It's before 22 to 25, but it's when the benediction's kind of occurring. And there are three words that, that all of this is tied to. It's the end of verse 22. We've seen the prayer, what it is, how it works, why it's necessary. Notice these three words, that this happens through Jesus Christ. Say them with me, ready? Through Jesus Christ. Now here's why I think the preacher or the author um, made sure these three words are in here. Inspired by the Spirit, yes, but, but why insert that phrase? Because the law is not good enough to do this. Moses, the prophets, angels, remember all the things that he spent time explaining in the book? Equipping the faith family to get God's will done will not happen by the law working in us or angels working in us. It's not going to happen by Moses or the prophets, but God works in us through Jesus Christ. He's superior, far better than the, the law, the angels, the prophets. That's Jesus. He's been shown as far better for 13 chapters. So he ends by saying this. This God who is the God of peace, man, he's going to do everything he needs to, and he'll be good to make sure his will gets done. How? Because of Jesus' work. Man, you can bank on it. That's why Jesus is loud and clear, front and center, better. Amen. What a great way to end this terrific sermon. Showing Jesus as the only way, the only avenue through which God will do His work. And so the question is not, can I do the checklist? The question is, do you know Jesus? You see, don't ask yourself, am I working out? Ask yourself, is God working in? 
We always ask the wrong questions. You notice that? Don't approach God's will as like, oh man, I, I can't do it all. Approach God's will as like he's left us an incredible opportunity for which he will empower us. I want to get to know God. He's promised to give me everything I need to get it done. See, it's, it's not about a requirement. It's about a relationship. So do you know Jesus? That's the avenue through which God does every bit of this through Jesus Christ. I hope the series title makes sense to you now. The theme of the book, the whole direction he's going. Because there is no other answer for your life, my life, or this church's mission than Jesus Christ. He's superior, far better, loud and clear, front and center. The book has shown that to be true. Now what do you say? We get to know him, and trust him and love him and worship him. And then through him, the sacrifice he has made at the altar of the cross, so to speak, let God use us to get his will done. Amen.